needs just a second and it might say to get itself all mixed up and no good. My doors. One stuck herself on a rock cliff trying to explore a nest. Sneaked her foolish self onto a porcupine too, pretending to be she, pretending she'd be a ghost, and got herself a snoop full of quilts for her efforts. Now this. Had I seen what she was doing back there in Homestead Meadows, I'd put it to an end before it began. I would have avoided it, avoided the meeting, ever talking place. But like this, with Doris, all all it takes, like, but like I said, with Doris, all it takes is but seconds. Audrey, Cal, Doris led me across the meadow until it dipped, and I saw not one but a whole group of deer grazing in unison. The unison, the heads raised, but I easily guess which one of them belonged to Doris's mother by the stern look on her face. We neared out a pace set somewhere between Doris's excitement and my hesitation. I tried to disarm her mother with a polite introduction, as mother would have encouraged me to do. I managed no more than, how do you do, my name is, before she cut me off. I said, I know. To her, I know what you are, girl. I've done heard accounts of your kind from family lore, different color, mind you, but you still fit the bill. Your type lives within the fences with them two leggings. You don't belong here, do you? I, I said, do you? Doris, dear. I did not know why Mama was, so, was being so mean and cold. She had gone to her like she was dangerous or something. I tried to explain to Mama that Audrey was all right, and we didn't need to worry about her, even if she was different from us. In fact, Audrey was, wasn't all that different, because her and me, we discovered we ate the same way, and then our stomachs were almost the same, too. Oh, yeah? I tried to tell Mama that, but she just hushed me up. No... Ma'am, she answered, this isn't where I belong. It's just that I have nowhere else to go. Mm hmm just as I was supposing. But then this here Audrey, she done explain her situation. I swallowed a heavy lump here in her tail. That poor girl had barely outgrown her childhood, and yet she was carrying roots heavier than a turtle with two shells. I had nothing personal against Audrey. I could see right from the get-go that she was no direct threat, which is why I let Doris endure with her Glory, but only up to a point. Audrey might have been fine in manners and said, but that don't mean she weren't dangerous. A big, passive creature like her has got herself a target on her hide. I didn't want Doris getting close when the howls and growls made them move, I said. You're welcome to gaze and browse with us during the day. Come night, fall, we, we part company. You may not bed with us if you survive until dawn. You may join us once more, and if you, and if during the day there's trouble, we won't wait for you. Is that understood, Audrey Cal? I said yes, ma'am. To be honest, I was very surprised to hear her talk as if danger was lurking just around the corner, because other than my active imagination and noise warnings, I had not encountered anything that I found my friend. But I wasn't one to argue with my elders, and I was grateful to have any company in my new forest life. As for where to bed at night, that problem was literally solved right then and there. Doris's family continued grazing, and as their progress took them over a small rise, suddenly I saw buildings at the far end of the meadow. I gasped in astonishment because before me was Bittersweet Farm. Only it wasn't Bittersweet Farm, you see. It was another farm, complete with a small house and barn and fences but all in terrible disrepair. It must have been abandoned many, many years earlier. Grass and reeds grew right up to the doorstep. The house may have been a cozy and cheery place in its prime, a place for a child like little girl Elspeth to feel content in, staring out the window toward the meadow on a cold, frosty morning. But now the remaining bits of red paint were faded. The chimney had crumbled and the roof had caved in toward the middle. It was a it was as if the house had given up trying to pretend it was still home and had sighed so intensely it broke itself and finally collapsed. As for the barn, it was no more welcoming. It, too, was much smaller than what I had known, with a low sloping roof. The trees had grown right against the wood sided walls, and moss and ivy covered the shingles like hair, hanging over the edges in unkept tresses. 
The barn door was pushed inward, held askew on a single bent hinge. I squeezed myself through, feeling as if I was forcing myself into the dank, dark mouth of some long, sleeping creature. I half expected to be chewed and swallowed at any moment. Inside the barn, I was pricked by a dozen narrow shafts of afternoon sun that poured through the many holes in the roof. I was intrigued by the strange patterns they created, but holes also meant that the roof offered little in the way of protection from the rain. I took a moment to consider whether this broken down dwelling could be my new home. It was not ideal, that was certain. It was neither comfortable nor comforting, but I only needed some protection in the night, so I decided it was suffice. Doris, dear, it was all good. Mama let Audrey be family with us, and I got to show her all the different plants. She had never seen and tasted before, and that girl can eat. Oh yeah, I showed her the pond in the river where the water is cool and tasty. I showed her the best trails and the warmest spots to rest. And Andre told me about Bittersweet Farm, Eddie and Buster, the lake called Alt Atlantica, and the place called France, where we decided we would go together and taste the clovers and meet all her cousins. When twilight came, which is when my jitters always get the best of me on account of the science snatchers that roam the midnight woods, Audrey would nuzzle and lick my ears with her crazy big tongue. She'd, she'd tell me happy stories that I could take into my dreaming so I could sleep better. Then she'd, she'd say good night and head over to Homestead Window and to bed in the, her barn. Before, before I closed my eyes, I always wished really hard that Audrey would be okay and survive the night so that I would see her at dawn the next day. Humphrey, human. I continued to hunt for the cow for several days. I also continued to be accompanied by Miss Murrow, or Torchy, as she insisted I call her. Each morning, I would encounter fresh bovine tracks that confirmed the animal was still alive. But consistent with the first day, her trail would simply end for no reason. Remarkably, too, whereas I had expected to find what civilians often refer to as cow patties, I discovered none whatsoever nor was I able to smell evidence of any, due to an almost unfailing cloud of skunk over that odor that had hovered above the trails. Contrary to what uh, Torchy wrote in her daily news reports, I was not frustrated or befuddled, nor did I ever throw down my wildlife of enforcement officer cap in a fit of utter exasperation. <clears throat> that would have been highly unprofessional. I was not put off by these setbacks, as I am a patient man. I was most willing to continue in the pursuit of the cow on my own. However, due to the growing public interest in the story generated by Miss by Torchy, my supervisor felt that a larger team of officers could end the hunt more quickly. Torchy, human. Poor Humphrey Dumphrey. Come day four, his boss is chewing his ear off, demanding results double time by threatening to demote old Hump to a guard at a petting zoo. I felt for the luck I did. But as a reporter, I'm rooting for the gal fighting for her life. Did I milk the story? You better believe it, sister. I know I had to slant this tale in the cow's favor. See, the readers needed to put themselves in Audrey's. That was her name, you know. Audrey's shoes. Not that I'm saying she was wearing a pair of loafers. But I wouldn't put it past her. That girl had pizzazz and plenty of moxie. We've all been there, see? We've all been backed into a corner with no place to go. But stop the presses. Audrey was a story that wouldn't go away. For days, running, not a sign of her. I'm thinking if the cow keeps it up, I'll have a two-week series. And maybe it will even go national. Round five takes a twist, though. Now I'm following half a dozen officers into the woods, each one of them more stone-faced than the next. Heck, old Hump was starting to look like Chuckles the Clown by comparison. Audrey Cow Nights in the barn were never pleasant. I had no hay to soften the ground, and the air was stale. I felt like I was stepped away in a messy old box. It was the opposite of freedom. The sky stayed clear, and the moon was waxing. Its light seeped in, sometimes cross-hatched across my flank, like fence chain, hemming me in even more. Those were the loneliest times. Back at Bittersweet Farm, I'd have drifted off to sleep, the hushed voices of Madge, Greta, and the other ladies in my ears. 
Now there was nothing soothing, nothing familiar. So I would make myself remember as vividly as possible all the friends I had left behind. I'd think of Eddie and Buster and Roy. I was squeezing drops of comfort out of my memories the way farmers squeeze water from a wet rag. There was Eddie running and barking with joy. There was Buster, his little eyes twinkling at a new filled trove, squeezing and remembering, squeezing and remembering until I could wring out a small smile. But memories are double-edged. They may warm you with happy thoughts of what you once had, but knowing you no longer have them leaves you cold, shivering, and alone. The fifth night was different. The fifth night was the worst. I heard sounds from outside, close to the wall. Padded steps with the faintest rustle of grass, controlled breath, a smack of lips, and then I saw a shadow projected onto the dirt floor. It was of a tail, rope thick and long. I stared near hypnotized as it slowly coiled and uncurled, while behind me a voice growled low and soft as a man ear. Been watching you, Charlize, it said, I'm wondering if you're dead. I jumped to my feet and turned, catching a sight of two fierce amber eyes peering in between the slots of wood. In a split second they were gone, as if I had imagined them, but I didn't. I could feel menace in the circle in the bar. I tried to keep track of the stranger's whereabouts, consistently shifting my position as she resumed proudly. First one way and then the other. Here you're dangerous, Shirley. Are you dangerous? Smelling fear in and out. Hmm, that makes me so hungry. Wondering about you, Shirley. Wondering, but close to the side. She was out of the moonlight's reach, which meant she was near to the door, which foolishly I had always left open. Why should I be afraid of you? I asked, attempting a light breezy quality to my quivering voice. We've never met, and I could not imagine you would mean harm. While I spoke, I walked as quietly as I could, managed toward the door. I listened for any twig snaps or breath exhales. Then, si then silence fell upon the barn, as deafening as a roar. Intentions were clear. The time for waiting was over. I saw a fan of whiskers caught in the moonlight, barely extended into the doorway. With all my force, I pushed against the door, casting out that yellow-eyed beast while catching a few of her whiskers in the door jam. She screamed and growled madly. Strong, hard nails scratched and clawed at the wood. The pressure against the rickety door was formidable. Was formidable. She pounced once, twice, again and again. Oh my, the threat was horribly clear. If I was ever to meet this creature in the open, exposed and unprotected, I would be no match for her at all. I would be her dinner.